So um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Maria Teresa Ferretti to joining us today. Uh, Maria Teresa um, is both a neuroscientist and a neuroimmunologist who co-founded the nonprofit organization, the Women's Brain Project. Uh, this is a project which is a world leader in the field on the study of sex and gender differences uh, and specificities and the importance of precision, precision medicine in both neurological and psychiatric uh, diseases. Maria Teresa has also uh, authored several papers on the topic, as well as papers on neuroinflammation in Alzheimer's disease, as well as uh, several books. So I recommend you uh, go uh, have a read of those. So without further ado, I'd, I'd like to invite Maria Teresa to come up and who will speak to us about sex and gender differences in Alzheimer's disease. And this is an update on from the Women's Brain Project. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if this works. Yeah. Here we are. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? Yes, does it work? Hi, everyone. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, so it's a really a, a great pleasure to be here, the first time for me at Imperial. So thanks a lot to, to Joe and the organizers for the invitation. And thanks to you for being here with us. And thanks to everybody who's connected online as well. Um, for giving me this opportunity to, to introduce to you um, and present to you the work of the Women's Brain Project and give you an update on sex and gender differences in Alzheimer's. I, what I hope to achieve with this presentation is to get you um, to give you an idea of why this topic is of interest. Um, I don't think that every single one of you should just drop everything you are doing in your research and focus on sex differences, but each one of you maybe could consider this as a cross-sectional topic that might actually enrich and improve the research uh, or whatever work you are doing right now in dementia. So let's see if I manage to go through the presentation like this. No, through the presentation like this. Okay. These are my disclosures. And let's start. So I built this presentation with three blocks. Um, I would like to give an introduction on the Women's Brain Project for those of you who are not too familiar with the organization. I then would like to spend a couple of minutes to talk to you about studying sex and gender differences and why this is important. And finally, I would give you an update on sex and gender um, studies in, in Alzheimer's disease. And I would like this to be a very interactive. So I'm going to stop once in a while and ask questions. And please feel free to ask questions during the presentation as well. And then we're going to have some time at the end also for discussion, if I understand correctly. So the Women's Brain Project, this is a non-profit organization that I co-founded uh, together with Antonella Santucciona Chada and Anne-Marie schumacher Dimek in Switzerland. Um, we created it, we had the idea in 2016, we registered it in 2017. I'm here in front of you today represented, uh, representing a big group of people. So behind me, there is really the Women's Brain Project team. <coughs> and it is... I'm sorry, uh, it is a privilege for me to represent this group. We have a relatively tiny, close, um, a small uh, core team, um, but um, with us work a large group of people and many of them uh, support us really pro bono for the science, the interest in the topic. We have a very uh, strong uh, footprint in social media. Some of you might be following us already on, on Twitter and other platforms, and if you are not, please do. Uh, we have a lot of international collaborations. We work with academic centers, but also uh, private companies and, and various stakeholders uh, around the globe. So we are based in Switzerland, but active globally. Our, um, our work has been recognized by several prestigious awards. Uh, recently, Antonella Santucciana won the Bev Clico Bold Woman Award and several others. So it, it's a nice recognition of the value of what we are doing. And the main output of our organization is, is really scientific activities and uh, policy activities and publications. So as Joe mentioned, lots of papers uh, and books, and I will be referring to, to some of them. In particular, if you have an interest in sex and gender differences in neuroscience, neurology, and in general in, in healthcare, um, I, I would like to direct you to these three books which we have edited. Um, these are really textbooks for people working in this field. Um, one is on Alzheimer's disease, is the first one uh, that we have edited uh, with Elsevier on this topic, uh, then on artificial intelligence, and uh, um, one that is more in general about neurological diseases. 
So especially the one on Alzheimer's disease is built on with three parts. You have a section on, on um, basic science, a section on clinical science, and a section on, on policy and socioeconomic uh, determinants of health. So whatever you're interested in, there might be something that might be useful for you. So uh, this is a useful resource. And um, what I would like to point out that is that makes this organization special, in my opinion, is that it is composed largely by scientists, and we do a lot of standard academic type of research, but um, we actually go one step farther. So we realize there is not enough to publish papers to change the status quo. Nothing ever happens if you don't talk to the policymakers, if you don't talk to the important stakeholders and also the lay public. So also thanks to um, Anade, who's here sitting with us today and is our policy lead, the, the lady with the red scarf. Uh, we have started a very intense program on, on policy activities. And this is one of the latest uh, projects and deliverables that we had, uh, which I encourage you to check because it's a white paper we published with The Economist. The Economist has a, a, a branch that does uh, health uh, economic research. We commissioned them, we asked them the question, you know, what is the economic value? What is the economic case of studying sex and gender differences? Because we know it's good from the scientific point of view. It's the right ethical thing to do, it's right for science, it's right for medicine, but is it also the right thing to do from an economic point of view? So this paper actually starts to address this question and the answer is yes. So what we do, is um, trying to, we hope, uh, trying to improve. So this you also see, huh? okay. Can I, can I close this without yes. close button and close? Um, our goal is to improve the state of medical treatment uh, by leveraging uh, sex and gender factors as the gateway to precision medicine. We cover um, basically 360 degree this topic from basic science, going through clinical science, <clears throat> socioeconomic determinants of health, but also novel technologies. And I will be giving you some examples. And our overarching goal would be to create a foundation and operate a dedicated research institute. We are in the process of creating this. It's not easy. Uh, we need all possible help. So I encourage you to, to support us uh, if you can. So this was the Women's Brain Project. Why we created the Women's Brain Project? What is the need? Why are we here today? Um, I would like to, I hope I will convince you that the study of sex and gender differences is actually important. Um, and I would like to frame it in the context of precision medicine. This is how we have uh, started this whole conversation uh, when we published the very first paper in 2018. It was this Nature Reviews Neurology paper on sex and gender differences in Alzheimer. And already in the title, as, like in that paper and in other papers we publish, we always um, point it in the context of precision medicine. So what we are trying to say here is that patients are not all equal. A one-size-fits-all approach doesn't really help in medicine in general, in particular in neurology, in particular in Alzheimer. Most likely we are pulling together patients that have different diseases. Um, so individual characteristics of patients are important and sex and gender characteristics belong to the um, to, uh, determinants of health. So it's something that we should consider for precision medicine. And when I talk about precision medicine, sometimes it sounds like it's science fiction. It's like too good to be true, but actually this exists already because in oncology and specifically for breast cancer, this is already applied. And I am a former uh, breast cancer patient, so I can speak to you, uh, you know, from a perspective of the patient, how important it has been precision medicine for me. So when, when patients with a breast uh, cancer come to their doctors, they might look very similar. They might have a, a breast cancer of more or less the same size, maybe on the same side of their bodies, but they are universe apart, right? They might look different, but they are completely different and doctors know that. So what they do now, oncologists, is actually um, a very deep and detailed um, molecular profiling of each patient because each tumor is different. We have, we have a number of markers, diagnostic and prognostic. So we have, we can characterize um, that individual patient, and we can actually allocate patients to specific subgroups that have specific requirements. And so the, the allocation of patients to specific subgroups can then inform the subsequent therapeutic journey of that patient. And this means basically avoiding, for instance, chemotherapy for everything and maybe giving um, uh, anti-estrogen uh, treatment to, to those that uh, need it and skipping other uh, treatments. So giving the right treatment to the right person at the right time based on the biology of the disease. So this is where we should get at some point in neurology as well. And in this picture, whether you are a man or a woman, it makes a difference. 
why makes a difference? So I, I would like to make sure we are all on the same page in terms of definitions, because this is not always straightforward. So what do I mean by sex and gender? Because when we're talking about characteristics of men and women, we can be referring to multiple things. So when I'm talking about sex, I'm referring to biological characteristics that are determined by the expression of sexual chromosomes and hormones. We tend to think that sex is binary. In the vast majority of cases, it is. There are exceptions, and things might be more complicated than what we have assumed so far in science. But for the sake of this presentation, for simplicity, we are referring to men and women as binary. On the other hand, gender, in, for this presentation, when I talk about gender, I'm talking about the socioeconomic, sociocultural construct of being a man or a woman in a society. So this encompasses all the, the expectations, the stereotypes, the roles that we associate with a man or a woman. The typical example that I give is the caregiving role, which is a topic that is very important for us. Caregiving is in basically all societies uh, an attribute of women. I personally don't think there is anything biological with that. It's, it's a societal construct. Uh, very similar education, access to education tends to be low in many parts of the world is lower for women than men. Uh, education is a determinant of health. And so this is an example of a determinant of health that can be different between men and women because of socioeconomic, sociocultural uh, reasons. The important take home message of this uh, slide is that both sex and gender are determinants of health. And this is not according to us, but according to the WHO. So the type of diseases you will get, the access that you have to healthcare and your response to treatment might be different if you are a man or a woman for both biological and socioeconomic, sociocultural reasons. So these are important uh, determinants that we need to consider. And I think the whole globe realized how important it is, or at least a big portion of, uh, of scientists and, and I think also lay public with the pandemic, um, because that was a very nice example of precision medicine. You have one virus that to one person, you know, it uh, induces something that is like a cold and the next person goes to the ICU for the same, in theory, the same disease. So there are obviously individual characteristics that drive the expression of this disease. And it was actually quite striking to see that not just age and obesity are uh, driving mortality, for instance, in, uh, in COVID, but sex was a very, very strong um, predictor of uh, mortality. So for men, actually, was um, being a man was a risk factor for mortality with COVID. We still don't know why exactly. We know it's similar for other viruses. Uh, this is a very interesting topic for investigation. It shows you clearly that sex can have a very profound effect on our health. And it's a very important topic for science and for public health. And yet, in spite of this, it's still quite, even in COVID, we don't really uh, have a lot of studies yet. It's not just COVID. A lot of diseases present differently between men and women and brain and mental disorders. I would like to make the point that actually almost any of them, at least the ones that we've been looking at, they do show some type of sex difference, either in the number of patients or in some other aspect like onset, uh, symptoms, progression and, and so on. Uh, this is a very simple schematics that um, it's you know, that doesn't really depict everything, but it's just to make a general point that there are disorders of the brain um, uh, that affect more men. They are in the blue uh, side of the, the, the pie. Uh, there are some that a lot actually that affect overwhelmingly women on the orange side. There is also a trend, which as a scientist, I find super interesting because the disorders that tend to affect more men, a lot of them you will see are neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, um, uh, the Tourette syndrome, early onset schizophrenia. You have also Parkinson's disease, uh, neurodegenerative and especially neuroinflammatory disorders overwhelmingly affect women. So there is already this type of uh, division, which is very clear in some cases, like for migraine, we are talking about 80% of patients being women. It's really overwhelming. And for me, it's, it, it really, I, I can't quite understand why nobody's studying, trying to, to, you know, to define what is driving this, uh, this vulnerability in, in women. Biologically, it's such an interesting question. We might learn so much, and yet this is not a focus uh, of research yet. So why we're not studying this more, and we were just discussing this with Stefano before, I have my theory, my hypothesis, and I would like to hear from you what you think about this. I think there is something special when we're talking about gender medicine and the brain. Gender medicine exists in medicine, and um, it's pretty well advanced in other fields like cardiology, oncology. This is something you can talk about. And I think nobody will complain. If you say that the heart of a man is different from the heart of a woman, 
most people will be fine with this statement and the story will end there. But the moment you say that the brain of a man is different from the brain of a woman, it's a completely different conversation, unfortunately. And historically, this type of studies that compare men and women at the brain level have been used to support all sorts of um, you know, misinterpretation of science, stereotypes, uh, and you know, completely wrong uh, statements. So basically to support an agenda that is sexist. And two examples that I want to give you, the moment you say that maybe the hippocampus of men is slightly larger than the hippocampus of women in some studies, that's the moment you have the, uh, the news, uh, the title, right? Aha, that's why women cannot park. You know, that's the immediate thing, the, 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 the reaction of the, the lay public. Or you might remember the Google memo. I don't know if you, if you remember this, maybe 10 years ago, something like that. Um, it was uh, a document where uh, an employee from Google was using scientific evidence, which is true, because if he was making the point that women are more affected by depression and anxiety, which is statistically, that's the way it is, overwhelmingly affecting more women. But he was using this to support the idea that there, therefore, biologically, women are not suited to have manager type of positions. So you see, one thing is the science and one thing is how the science is used and is interpreted. And this is a big barrier. So we are talking about neurosexism. And of course we have to avoid this and, and, and fight against it. But I think it's one of the reasons why a lot of scientists basically don't want to have anything to see with this type of research because it's a very delicate political, it becomes immediately political and it is not scientific anymore. However, my point here is that we can't, we can't give up. We can't just uh, not do it. We have to do it. And, and I hope you will agree with me uh, by the end of this presentation. We have to find a way around this. So I would like to ask you, um, I, I, I like to ask questions to the audience. In, in the past, I used to ask if you think sex and gender are the same, but now people are very well educated, so I'm not asking that anymore. Um, but this one about the brains being sexually dimorphic, I like to ask it because a lot of nice conversations um, stem out of this. So do you think human brains are sexually dimorphic? So there is a, a morphological dimorphism between men and women. Who would say yes? Let's see. People say yes. And I'm assuming the others say no or they don't want to express themselves for political reasons. Um, let me drink a little bit. Of course, if, if when I do it on Zoom, I like to do a poll, but uh, down here, this is not possible. So there is no right or wrong answer to this question. I'm going to give you my answer. If when we're talking about dimorphism, if we are talking about this, biologically dimorphism is a trait that is completely different between males and females, like the tail of a peacock. If that's what we are referring to, I think we can all agree that it's not dimorphic because thank God we more or less all have brains with different, uh, but yeah, uh, we all have it. However, it's undeniable that there are some regions and nuclei that are specific for men and women have been described and are consistently different in men and women. This is an example. Um, you find uh, quite a rich literature that um, used several techniques to characterize structural differences, both in gray matter and in white matter. There are some regions that consistently come up as different between men and women in one direction or the other, the famous hippocampus in, in men, but also, for instance, the insula or the temporal cortex larger in women. It is not an easy literature to dive into. It's, it's not easy, and um, I think we need more uh, and better quality studies as well. Um, what I would recommend, if you're interested in this specific topic, I recommend you this very extensive review. It's not a systematic review, but it's really exhaustive. Like they really look at a lot of studies, putting together all the literature. The conclusion of Liz Elliott is that we can dump the term dimorphism because overall there are no real differences. However, if you read this, this review, you will find two things. One is that there is one difference that is very clear and it's size size of female brains is consistently smaller than men, not, not by a lot, but is consistently. Can we say that size has no effect whatsoever? I don't know. I mean, that might be a driver of differences. I, we can't just say that is um, uh, irrelevant. And the other thing is that she, um, I mean, the review actually covers quite a lot of structures and, and findings that are consistently reported in the literature. So there are certain things that seem to be more robust, but the effect size is very small. So we are talking about differences that are really, really tiny. So can we say that these tiny differences have no impact whatsoever? Again, I don't know, honestly, to be honest with you, I can't say, but if you're interested in this topic, this is um, a useful paper. I, I am personally not super um, 
uh, interested in this type of approach. I don't think we can explain the complexity of our brains, um, of our behavior, and especially the way we respond to pathology, because that's what the Women's Brain Project is interested in. What happens when there is a disease? So explaining the way we, our brains respond to pathology just with you know taking a ruler and measuring things in the brain, I think is not giving you the full story. It's much more complex. And there are a lot of biological, physiological processes that are different in men and women that we barely know about. We are just starting to look into. And I just want to give you an example uh, from genetics because this is something I was never taught in school when I when I studied biology. And this, I, this is something that I discovered later on and I was like, why nobody ever told me this? Uh, just to say how complex um, women are, uh, females in general, because of the X uh, chromosome inactivation. And if I'm telling you something that you know super well, please, Go like is it uh, clear to everybody the X chromosome inactivation? But just very quickly to explain to you what it is, um, because women have two X chromosomes, as you know, in utero one of them is inactivated randomly in every cell to avoid overexpression of X-linked genes. The interesting thing is that this inactivation is completely random, so two neighboring cells might be expressing two different X chromosomes, so two different sets of alleles. And this is visually represented by this cat, where the color of the fur is carried by the X chromosome, and you have an allele that is orangey and an allele that is black. And you can see that you have areas where some cells are activating one chromosome with a black allele, and some others are activating the orange allele. So it's a visual representation of this mosaic that we are. And we women, we are like this in every organ, including the brain. So it's an extra level of complexity. Why this is important is that the X chromosome actually contains 5% of our genes, it's huge. Uh, in it, it has implication for health because men are more susceptible to X-linked uh, genes mutations. But then things are interesting because genes can escape X inactivation. So all of a sudden some genes can be expressed and at that point they are overexpressed in women. And that might be, some, some scientists are, are thinking that maybe it's one of the reasons why women are more vulnerable to some diseases. It might be because on X chromosome, uh, you have, uh, there is an enrichment in brain and in new related genes. So it's, it's actually, it, it might be, uh, it might have an effect. Just to tell you, this is one thing, but biologically there is so much that is different between men and women. And I think um, those might be the points where we should do more research. So about Alzheimer's disease, I'm gonna stop just a second and see if there is any comment, burning question. Any, yes. And that well, is not brain per se, mm -hmm. it's a class in the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. So it's beyond structure, you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, mean, I mean, the effect of hormones and the partners was not from sports. You have one up there. Well, I was talking about the medical brain, I was talking about sex, biology, determined, and gender norms. I do you think there's a case to be made for androgens prenatally um, and exposure to them influencing outcomes, gender outcomes? But so here is where it depends what we mean by, by gender, because I'm not talking at all about gender identity, sexual orientation, absolutely not that. It's what society thinks a man or a woman should be, how society thinks a man or a woman should act. So how do you distinguish gender identity? What this is the, yeah. I, so this is a very complicated topic, to be honest with you. And that's why I always have the slide where I say, when I'm saying gender, I'm referring to this and not to everything else. And I, I don't think there is a consensus um, scientifically on exactly how we define all these different things. But the, the use of gender in this presentation is about what society thinks of men and women, not our own gender identity. So very, very, very super important topic because I think also that is a determinant of health and it is biologically determined. Maybe it's also a social economic construct. Who knows? It's it's like, I think at some point we, as scientists, we will have to, to, to tackle this and we're not there yet. Yeah, but thank you. 
But let me tell you something about where we are with Alzheimer's disease, which is the field that I've, I've personally been working on in the past 15 years and has been the, the field that we started with uh, Women's Brain Project. We started with Alzheimer's and then we moved on, uh, like we broadened up, um, but Alzheimer's is really at the heart of what we do. Um, I'm not sure I need to present to you what Alzheimer's is, but just in case, to so make sure we're all on the same page, this is a neurodegenerative disease, it's progressive, it's characterized by a progressive loss of uh, cognitive function, it has, I always show this, um, this drawing with uh, the clock test because it shows that it is a continuum. So it has a prodromal, it has a preclinical phase that is symptomless. Um, we have a prodromal phase called MCI, my cognitive impairment. And then most patients in MCI due to AD progress to uh, late AD, so full blown uh, dementia. And um, neuropathologically, Alzheimer's brains are characterized by extensive uh, atrophy, so shrinkage. Uh, of the of the, um, the brain parenchyma enlargement of the ventricles and two telltale uh, lesions, the amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary uh, tangles of tau. And this, I, I'm mentioning them because we will be referring to some biomarkers and some treatments that target them. So it's important to, to have this in mind. Uh, we are talking about 55 million diagnosed with dementia in general and most likely 70% with Alzheimer's, so big numbers. However, this is, these are the people diagnosed with dementia. There are a lot of patients that are not diagnosed with dementia, and there is also all the people that most likely are starting are in the continuum. So they might start to develop the pathology in their brains, but they are not um, diagnosed yet. Um, and so we have actually estimated um, how many these people could be the amyloid positive population worldwide, and we are talking about 400 million people. I mean, of course, these are estimates, but the numbers are really scary. Um, we are starting to, we have symptomatic treatments and we are starting to have disease modifying uh, treatments for this disease. We have worked extensively in the field of Alzheimer's disease. We have published the first um, review in this uh, field in 2018, a number of other um, reviews also endorsed by the European Academy of Neurology, primary papers, um, primary research papers, uh, a lot of policy uh, work, again, uh, thanks to uh, Anna De. Um, also, books for the lay public and uh, textbooks, as I told you, for uh, the specialists, so quite a lot of activities. If you're curious about the story of uh, all our contributions in Alzheimer's, we just published kind of a summary paper in Frontiers. Laura Castro is the first author, so um, that's uh, a nice resource. So when we talk about sex and gender in Alzheimer's, we have to start from these numbers because that's the one thing that everybody knows about. The vast majority of patients with Alzheimer's are women, about two thirds. The vast majority of caregivers to patients with Alzheimer's are women. So it's a double burden on women as patients and as caregivers. And this is super important. Again, we don't know why more women than men develop Alzheimer's. Um, I personally think it's a very relevant question as a scientist, I would like to know. However, I would like to convince you that this is not the whole story. So I would like to move away from the numbers and the frequency and actually talk about precision medicine in Alzheimer's. So it's not so much about number of patients, but if you have a patient that is a man and a patient that is a woman, is there a difference or are they the same? So what I'm trying to say is that when we're talking about gender medicine, it's not just, it's unfortunate that you can't read the titles, but anyways, it's not just um, um, frequency, it's not just numbers, but also um, a lot of other aspects from the biological, thank you, <laughs> from the biological mechanisms to risk factors, biomarkers, symptoms, progression, drug response, and also care. So sex and gender have, <laughs> have an impact at, at all these levels. And I would like to give you a couple of examples from for each one of almost uh, each one of, uh, of these. So not just numbers. In terms of biological mechanism, if I manage to go to the next slide. <coughs> One topic that is booming at the moment is menopause and hormones uh, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is a tricky one because um, all women go through menopause and it's not that all women develop Alzheimer's disease, thank God. So there is something with menopause and Alzheimer's, but we don't quite, we still don't quite understand what. Uh, there has been a lot of recent uh, research that I find fascinating, especially led by uh, Rachel Buckley, and I'm showing you one of her recent uh, papers. She has a more recent one looking at HRT, hormonal replacement uh, therapy as well. 
She has been studying uh, levels of tau pathology in brains of uh, men and women. Um, and she has been the first one to document that actually women tend to accumulate more tau than men for the same amount of amyloid. Uh, there is kind of an accelerated accumulation of tau. Um, interestingly enough, in this paper, they show that this difference uh, starts to happen at the postmenopausal stage. So it's something up to menopause, men and women have the same levels of amyloid and tau if you have tau, but something happens when women enter menopause. So it's, it's very preliminary, it's just the beginning, but it's to tell you that we are starting to understand that menopause is kind of a window of vulnerability where something can happen in some women and can basically throw them into the pathological uh, trajectory if they are amyloid uh, positive. Uh, so from a biological point of view, what is the link between estrogen? So yeah, menopause, most likely estrogen deprivation and amyloid and tau pathology, especially tau pathology. We don't know, but this is a very, you know, interesting and, and um, you know, a robust scientific question to, to address uh, that I, I hope some of you will tackle as well. So there might be something biologically different between men and women. Um, this is also reflected in, in risk factors and risk factors, you know, I could give an entire lecture on risk factors by itself. Um, it, because there are differences between men and women. There are some risk factors that are more common in women than men or men than women. Uh, there are some risk factors that, are, that have a different impact on men and women. This is an example of risk factors that are sex specific. So risk factors that apply only to, in this case, women. And the one that I like to talk about is premature menopause. So we are talking about menopause before the age of, in this case, 46, like 40, 46 year, um, years of age. So this is surgical induced menopause in most cases or spontaneous uh, menopause, but in vast majority, in, in this study, they look at uh, surgical induced. Um, very often oophorectomy that is done for oncological reasons. And these ladies are pushed into a forced menopause. And this has been shown by Walter Rock and many other uh, scientists to be uh, a risk factor for my cognitive impairment. So again, pointing to the link between estrogen deprivation and uh, uh, Alzheimer's type of uh, pathology. Why this is important? So the, the, the slide that I showed you before, my take-home message is, you know, if you're doing science, this is an interesting question to address. This is really talking about prevention and preventative campaigns and um, individualized, uh, individual level uh, risk profile. So when, you're, when you have your patient and you're trying to uh, quantify what is the risk of that specific person to develop Alzheimer, and we are developing algorithms to do that, whether your patient is man or woman makes a difference. And this type of uh, sex-specific or um, yeah, sex-dependent uh, risk factors should be factored in to make whatever tool we are developing more precise. In terms of biomarkers, um, this is also a very big topic right now. Um, there has been an explosion of papers uh, in literature in this topic. In general, what we are seeing, and I think I can show you directly this, in terms of amyloid as a biomarker of Alzheimer's disease, we can't really find anything very robust and consistent differences between men and women yet. What is consistent is differences in tau in both fluid and imaging biomarkers showing more pathology in women, accelerated, so faster rate of accumulation. There is a very strong interaction with EPOE. So EPOE4 carriers actually show this uh, even more. Um, so you, you, I'm showing you a couple of examples of papers showing differences in CSF, in uh, PET, even in blood, uh, in plasma, uh, in PITAU, which is now the, the new thing. We are going to be presenting some results of uh, fluid biomarkers in a preclinical cohort at AAIC. But um, this is the point that I wanted to discuss with you, because if any of you is doing research in this field in biomarkers, you might be just comparing cross-sectional levels of biomarkers in men and women, and nothing, it might be that there are no differences. However, this is not the end of the story, because in some cases, the same amount of biomarker has a different meaning for men and women. For instance, the same amount of amyloid actually correlates with higher accumulation of tau in women. And in the plasma biomarker paper that I'm showing to you, they actually, they did not find differences in absolute levels, but the difference is found in the predictive value. So for the same amount of biomarker that you have today, what does that mean in five years? What is your risk at three and five years of developing Alzheimer? So never stop just at the cross-sectional comparison, but always consider the time dimension because a lot of these sex differences in Alzheimer's, actually you don't see them if you look only at one time point, but you see them when you have a longitudinal uh, approach to this research. 
And again, why is this cool for me? Because we are developing biomarkers and algorithms again to predict uh, potential risk of developing us, well, to diagnose and then also, I hope, uh, predict the risk of developing Alzheimer. Whatever tool we are developing, if we integrate these sex differences, it's going to be more precise. So it's just to consider one additional element to make things better, to leverage these differences. And it's not just your classical fluid and imaging biomarkers. We at the Women's Brain Project, we are very big fans of digital biomarkers. I don't know if any of you works in digital biomarkers here. Yeah. yeah. So big topic, you know, huge potential. Um, I think this is the future for Alzheimer's disease for a number of reasons we can uh, discuss all together. Um, and uh, we have been, I think, the first ones to ask the question, is it possible there are differences between men and women also in digital biomarkers? And to answer this question, we have partnered with Altoida, which is a developer of a digital biomarker that can predict conversion from NCI to dementia. Uh, their um, app is based on uh, augmented reality which is basically the technology that is used in Pokemon Go. I don't know if any of you has ever played Pokemon Go, but it's that type of thing. So you see extra uh, like additional elements in your camera that are augmented with the reality that you actually have in the room. Like, I don't know if you see it, there is a little bear here. Um, and this allows the person to interact with the environment. You put a bear in one place and then you have to remember where you put it, these type of things. So we ask the question, is there a difference between men and women? We, we actually did the analysis and what we found was that there, there are differences between the data collected by men and women, so much so that you can train a classifier, a sex classifier, so you can train an algorithm to tell you if the person using the app is a man or a woman. So there is something that we still don't quite understand that can be picked up by machine learning. That, is, that differentiates men and women. I mean, this is not the perfect uh, classifier, but it's good enough. And it's the point of this paper is really not to say that we need an algorithm to classify men and women. It's not that, but it's to say that there are some differences here. And so maybe we should actually pay attention to this again, because we might use them to improve the predictive value of this uh, algorithm. One very important point about differences in men and women that has that is emerging in the literature is the differences in symptoms and progression. And I'm gonna drink a little bit before I tell you this part of the story. These are data from the ADME cohort. Um, they, they have been seen in other cohorts, but the ADME is the strongest one. Um, interestingly enough, these are women with MCI. Um, when you follow them over eight years, Women with MCI decline, so have a cognitive decline, which here is, is going actually up, um, uh, twice as fast as men. So there is a, a, a very strong difference in the rate uh, of decline, uh, which has huge implications for all sorts of research that you might be doing, especially clinical trials, because you might have a population that is fast progressing and a population that is low progressing. So this might, make, might have an impact when you are testing drugs. We don't really know why this happens. The current theory is that most likely we are diagnosing women too late. So this is a reserve type of thing. Um, in the early stages of the pathology, it looks like women can somehow mask their, um, their symptoms. So they go undiagnosed for a very long time. When you finally diagnose a woman with MCI, she's actually much more advanced in the disease trajectory than men. Um, and so that's why, you know, the, the farther you go, the, the faster the decline. So that's the current interpretation of this data. I think we need some science to, to substantiate this. Uh, but for instance, there has been uh, this one, uh, this paper from uh, Sunderman uh, et al. a couple of years ago that has actually looked at um, the diagnostic criteria for classifying amnestic MCI in a, in a cohort at the Mayo Clinic. And they found in this specific cohort, the criteria they were using were not sex adjusted. So they said, what would happen if we were to adjust uh, considering sex? Because for a lot of tests that we use to detect MCI, women have a slight advantage, they outperform men. So what if it's too easy, basically, this test for women when you use a general cutoff? What if we adjust the cutoff for women and men? If we were to do that, and they, they, they did um, the calculations, they found that actually you would have uh, a lot more women diagnosed with MCI than we currently have. Right now we have more men than women diagnosed with MCI, which doesn't really make sense. It's more women than men. It might be that we are missing the MCI in the, in the women. So we, need, we definitely need more research on this, but this is potentially very important 
And I'm going to tell you why. Because of drug response. Um, I don't know if you've been following the literature about um, anti-amyloid immunotherapy and uh, the three antibodies that we, we had uh, now, where we had first aducanumab, uh, then lecanemab, uh, now recently donanemab. Um, some results have been presented by Gant uh, gantanerumab as well. Uh, here I'm showing you the results of lecanemab. Um, the, the subgroup analysis actually showed um, uh, some difference between men and women, right, which seemed to favor men. And one of these, to be honest with you, when, when I look at this just by itself, you go like, hmm, who knows? I mean, it's, it's one study, one clinical trial. The interesting thing here is that the same has been observed with aducanumab. If you check the published data, it's the same trend. And the same has been shown with gantanerumab. These are data presented at uh, the ADPD. In all these antibodies, which have a very similar mechanism of action, for some reason, the effect is stronger in men than women. So we have no idea, you know, if these, are, these studies were not designed to answer specifically this question, and this is not the ideal statistical analysis to do. But what if really, you know, these drugs are really working better in men than women? Many hypotheses that are, we put forward, that there are many others, but what if really we are diagnosing women too late and they are much more advanced in the pathology? Maybe they are in an amyloid independent phase of the pathology. Getting rid of amyloid is not enough for them, while in men is still, you know, you are in the right uh, time frame. These are all hypotheses, uh, which I think are extremely relevant. And again, they could improve the way we are uh, testing drugs and, and then treating patients. So we definitely need more research on this. And we have been saying that we need more research in clinical trials for a very long time. We published a couple of years ago this systematic review where we asked a very simple question that nobody had asked before for some reason. So if women are two-thirds of patients with Alzheimer's disease, are they also two-thirds of patients in clinical trials? Because you would expect it to be one-to-one. -one. And actually what we found in this paper is that no, when you, when you average all AD trials, um, the percentage is, um, is much lower. Actually, in the vast majority of experimental ED trials, also these drugs that I showed you before is about 55%. Uh, uh, it's still more women than men, but it's not the 65% that you would expect based on the real um, the, the, the epidemiology of the disease. So we don't know exactly why this happens. It happens also in stroke trials with elderly women. So it might be some barrier to elderly women to access um, clinical trials. It might be that we are systematically excluding women with some inclusion exclusion criteria unintentionally, but it might be. We have some data in that direction. It might be that they're dropping out more often than men for any reason. Maybe they don't have a caregiver that can accompany them in clinical trials, and that's why. I think there is, again, this is just to pose the question, and maybe it's something that we should consider a bit more, especially when we're talking about uh, uh, equity, gender health uh, equity. There might be barriers here, spe specifically for women that we're not considering. And actually, maybe having a more representative population of your disease, maybe that's something we should aim for when we are designing clinical trials. Maybe 50-50, which looks okay when you first read the paper, you know, 50-50, that's balance, but maybe it's not the best choice when you're testing a drug. So these are all questions that we're posing. Yes, we have a question. Sorry, can we just for the benefit of people online, can we... Thank you. Uh, do you think we could also have sex-specific trials, as in one trial for men, one trial for women, and see if maybe some treatments or some targets are more beneficial for either gender or sex? That could be the, the future. It could be. I mean, for some, in, in us, um, we need a bit more uh, evidence for that, but it might be a future direction. And you might, a point that I'm asked very often is that you need to increase astronomically your N, so it's going to be super expensive. But actually, my point to that is that the power to any, of any study it depends on your N, but also on the variability. So what if separating men and women, actually, you reduce the variability that you have in your sample, so you actually can reduce uh, the N as well. I don't know, but I think this type of discussion we, we should have with um, people that, that do this, the, the trialists.
And in this same paper, we also check another thing. We check how many um, published papers that reported results of clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease, how many of them reported sex stratified data. And actually, it was a very small percentage. It was like 12%. And I'm sure they all did it, the sex certification like this that are there, but they're just not reported in the literature. And we have a call to action to just encourage everybody to, to actually you know, report this data, even if it's negative. Otherwise, you have publication bias. Um, one last project that we did that I wanted to present to you, a patient pathway for Alzheimer's disease, because I've shown you the science, um, but actually, how does this impact the life of patients living with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers? We wanted to know that. We realized that publishing all these papers was not enough. So we had, uh, we did a survey-based uh, study where we asked people specific questions based on some hypotheses that we had of things that could be different in the journey. And we are analyzing the data now. We will be publishing a, a paper about it. But we found that actually men and women have very different experiences from the initial diagnosis, you know, what brings them to the doctor, what suspicion, um, what, what uh, symptoms they notice, uh, what doctors they go to, how long it takes to have a diagnosis, where they look for information, uh, their awareness levels, acceptance levels of uh, treatments and side effects. I mean, all these things are different for men and women. And this is also something we should start uh, considering. And this is really the end of my presentation, and I wanted to add this um, to, to make kind of a, a final point about equity and precision medicine. Does anybody know what this is? Interesting. So none of you has done the... Camino de Compostela, exactly. <laughs> Very good. 100 points. <laughs> this is the symbol of the Camino Santiago de Compostela. It's actually a shell. But many people think that it represents the several paths that all lead to Santiago. And when I saw it, I thought, you know, this is a very nice representation of precision medicine because we all want our right to health, right? We, we all want treatments that work, but the way we can get there might be very different according to our individual characteristics. And uh, I've done this um, Walk in the Talk for Dementia, which has been an amazing experience. I want everybody to know about it. Group of scientists, but also patients, um, doctors, nurses, political scientists, everybody work, walking this talk for raising awareness on Alzheimer. And um, the other thought that I had about uh, this symbol is that it also represents very well the concept of equity, gender health uh, equity. And here is where I just want one slide about this topic to show you one slide about the, the topic of caregiving. Um, because we go back to the story that two-thirds of caregivers are women, and this has a profound effect on women worldwide. We are talking about women that in, in a lot of cases have to quit work and become full-time caregivers. So they stop having a salary, they stop having, or they, they reduce drastically their uh, pension later on. So are women that abandon the workforce, um, and they are exposed to a lot of uh, risk for their health, because being caregivers is actually a, a, also a risk factor for a, a lot of conditions. So there is something there that we are not addressing at all as a society. And in this case specifically is about women, really. What I showed you before is about men and women together, but here is really about um, how with society we are dealing with this issue. And I think there is a big case for uh, an issue with gender uh, equity because we cannot expect women to contribute to the society to their fullest if they are basically stuck because many of them are sandwiches. So they, they have to take care of their family, but also of the elderly uh, ones. So there is a very big topic here that is gender related, socioeconomic that somehow we are not addressing. And I didn't want to conclude this presentation without talking about it. And it's about equality and equity. It's not enough to give everybody the same starting conditions because people are different and they have different needs. And so if we want to achieve uh, gender equity in health, we have to consider also these different uh, aspects. And this is why, and this is my conclusion slides, again, going back to the economist impact paper, um, I want to conclude by telling you that we cannot really, we cannot afford to neglect these differences. It's the right thing to do from a scientific point of view, but it's also something that if we don't do it, is we're really missing out. We are missing out as scientists because we are not really understanding the cause of many diseases and, and this type of research might help us. We are missing out as, as doctors and you know, in clinical practice, we could improve so much clinical practice by this. Um, and then also we need to consider these gender differences in the society also from a uh, health uh, equity uh, perspective. And when you put all these things together in an economic model, which is what we are trying to do with this white paper, you actually see that if we were to study this and address this, actually overall there will be a saving because we would have a, a medicine and research that is more sustainable, is more precise, uh, and is more uh, equitable uh, again. So I hope I convinced you this is important. 
I would like to thank you on behalf of the whole team, and I encourage you to follow us, um, consider donating, very important for us. We are in the process of establishing an institute, and we're looking for partners, so let me know if, uh, if you're interested. And I think this is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's see if we've got any questions online. Not yet. Okay. All right. Do we have any questions in the room? Comments or comments or Oh, sorry. It's gonna work. Is this gonna work? Yes, it yes. is. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really interesting. And also, I think a very important topic, not just in Alzheimer's, but um, from other kind of fields. So for example, in stroke, where my area is, we know that for a given lesion, if you correct for kind of location of the lesion and also age of the patient, women have poorer longitudinal outcome. But whether this is biological or whether it's because of socioeconomic factors, maybe they don't have a carer, maybe they don't engage with therapy. I think that's quite debatable we don't we still don't know why that is or maybe it's just estrogen effects on vessels and so forth um i think there is a risk that if we re reduce everything to biology then all the politicians and kind of society will put their hands up and say it's nothing to do with us let's not uh, kind of treat this uh, inequity and i think we have to be very careful for all of those studies that are published mm -hmm. there could be an explanation for example the uh, virtual reality um, the kind of rock mm -hmm. that you showed, was that corrected for uh, patients kind of uh, literacy on, in terms of using a device? Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. women uh, are not familiar with the device as much as the men are. I mean, have they used the device for the same hours, for example, were those corrected? Otherwise, we, we will risk reducing everything to biology, and then we can exacerbate social economical kind of inequities between women and men. But I think it's a really important topic and certainly has an impact on patients, women. Great. Thank you for the comment and just a quick answer. I don't know if Anna, who is our uh, political scientist, uh, wants to uh, answer that. But from my point of view, actually, this is a plus because a lot of biological things, we can't really change them. But uh, the socioeconomic aspects and determinants of health, actually, those are modifiable. So it's actually a strong, we should never forget about those because we, on those, we can actually act uh, immediately. Um, so I think they are super important, both of them, even though I'm more of a scientist, so I come more from, from that angle. I'm, I'm checking if Anna agrees. <laughs> I agree on that. I'm point of view, we focus very much there on the gender side of things and how people shape the same A lot of um, Women's Brain Project at a global policy level with the likes of the World Health Organization, OECD, and others to really sort of enhance um, the understanding of these issues and further the fact base. We're actually in the um, coming months as well, we're going to work on a dedicated um, caregivers and brain health policy project as well. Um, so it's very important for us, as Mary Teresa highlighted in the presentation, we don't just focus on the sex biological differences, but also on the gender differences as well. That's very much our approach. Other hands raised before. I think Mandalena's had to leave. Ah, okay. Um, we, we do have a question online, yeah. um, so I'll just read it out. It's from Jackie from Alzheimer's Research UK. Um, the question is, are there any examples of particularly good practice in addressing these differences in health policy and research in specific countries that could be shared more globally? Like best practice uh, approaches in countries, but in research specifically? or um, Policy and research. Health policy, <laughs> again, looking at um, um So in research, in general, there has been a push uh, that started, I would say, in the States and then Canada and Australia, and now Europe is following, for always including, you know, um, whenever you're applying for grants, or, um, including an explanation of how you are addressing sex differences, if you're stratifying the results. So this from the funders 
uh, move. I think it's it's very good and it motivates people to at least think about it. However, very often it becomes a checkbox type of thing. So it's, it's a beginning, but I'm not sure it's enough. Um, something else that I think it's helping, and this is mostly that I've seen in the States and in Canada, uh, dedicated funding for this type of research. Because again, I don't think that everybody should just focus on this research, but at least now we need a critical mass of researchers that are pushing this topic uh, forward and creating the, the base. And for that, you need funding. You need dedicated funding. So that's uh, the Alzheimer's Association in the States has a dedicated call, which I think it's uh, it's really good for uh, for research. Uh, and the, the next thing should be from, uh, and some publishers are starting to look into it, but also when you publish, results, it should become mandatory that you address this type of sex and gender differences. And I think some journals are starting to look into that, uh, but right now I, I can't really tell you which ones uh, exactly. And I don't know if there is any other example of best practice that we can think of. Um, ah, and the other thing is education. So we have mapped um, initiatives of education of gender medicine in Europe, especially in neurology. Um, it's a paper we published in the European Journal of Neurology um, a couple of years ago, not one year ago. Uh, so something that is also extremely important from a policy perspective is to educate uh, doctors and researchers in general, but especially doctors that these differences exist. So gender medicine as an integral part of your cur curriculum. In some universities, this is done, um, not in all of them. So there is no harmonization. And at the moment, it's mostly led to the individual initiative of some professors that are very passionate about this topic. So something that would help would be to have a Europe-wide or you know, more international type of uh, plan to, to address this in a, in a coordinated uh, way. But we are not there yet. Thank you. I've certainly noticed in grant applications, I think more recently, that uh, it's asked about uh, sex and gender mm -hmm. balance in your in your experimental groups. So I think there are changes happening. Yeah. Um, thankfully. But, you know, it's the balance, but then it's also you stratify how are you analyzing the data? Are you mm -hmm. using sex as a covariate, as you were saying? Absolutely. You know? It's there are a lot of extra steps mm -hmm. to do. So yeah. I'd, um, but considering a couple of years ago it wasn't mentioned wasn't at happening. all. Exactly. So, exactly. Um, okay, I think we've got a question in the middle. Thank you. Uh, I had one comment about your slide with the 65% of women on carers and women more offer or often are in caring jobs or healthcare. And I read that in uh, the Nordic states, where there's very aggressive uh, policy, uh, very aggressive policies towards uh, equality and, you know, aiming at 50 50% 50 of men and women in all professions, the disparity, the, the difference between men and women in healthcare jobs is rather stable, mm -hmm. which suggests that there is a sort of biological drive to be carers in mo more women than in men. Mm -hmm. So you would not, even with aggressive uh, social policies and corrections, you would not get this 50, 50 percent uh, carers. So but you're referring to professional health uh, caregivers, right? Not just not professional. Just... It's visible in STEM jobs and right. healthcare jobs mo most often, but it's something, it's more general. They also investigated uh, child play for example and you know uh, little girls who play more often uh, um, you know family you know family play where they pretend to be mothers and to care for or to care for an animal that kind of stuff so do you think that policy would be a, a more interesting policy would be maybe to support women better rather than trying to get more men oh 50 percent mm -hmm. of those jobs failed by men yeah so just one comment to that <clears throat> first of all the statistics is about informal caregivers so what happens in families when you consider also the healthcare, um, like the, the professional caregivers is like 80 percent are women so it's uh this is just what happens in, in the informal caregivers um the fact that there might be something already that you see in like biological basically that you already see in kids and all that <clears throat> i'm personally not super convinced to be honest with you and the problem is that it's impossible to do an experiment to really show it because you should raise kids under you know uh, uh, how do you say that like in a completely isolated environment 
and not exposed to any example because of course kids see that model in families where women tend to be the caregivers so they tend to reproduce it maybe you know maybe not but to be able to really say it we would need to run an experiment where this does not exist and at the moment is impossible like nobody has figured out how to really test this scientifically so at the moment we don't know it might be both um in terms of policy then what do we do with this actually most of our call to actions are really aimed at saying, you know, this is a huge problem for women right now in the society. We have to support these women. We cannot afford this. So at the moment, we are really calling uh, for dedicated uh, uh, actions that support women, that integrate somehow their salary, their pensions, that give them some type of support in, in the work, that allow them to work at the same time, you know, this type of support, because it's really as I said, it's women that are basically leaving the, the workforce and we are missing them in the society. So try and, and getting them back as much as possible. Policy actions to actually convince the men to be the caregivers, that's way more ambitious. And uh, I think we are not there yet, but it will be part of a, actually I would be curious to hear what you think about this, if we can, what we could do to, to, to shape, this again is gender stereotypes, I think, working to normalize, equalize this type of gender stereotypes, which may be, it will never be 50-50 as you are saying, but maybe we can improve it a little bit. Yeah. It's huge. So I think there is space for reducing it. I don't know if we will ever get to 50-50. I don't know. Yeah. There's another question online and actually something I was going to ask about, and that is intersectionality. Mm -hmm. And so the example given online is that in the US, black women have an even higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And so how important, well, first of all, I guess, do you know of any studies where they've looked at intersectionality uh, in terms of risk and, and how important do you think that is going forward? So there are studies that are starting to appear in the literature on this, and I, I really want to highlight when we are talking about sex and gender, we always present them as the gateway to precision medicine. They're definitely not the end of the story. Actually, it's just the beginning. So we wanted to use sex and gender as a very easy um, topic to convince people that we have to consider individual characteristics. But then it's, it's not... It's not the only thing. There is also ethnicity, race, if you want to consider it, the socioeconomic status, genetics, a lot of other. So for sure, sex and gender, you have to see them in a matrix, a cross-sectional type of approach, intersectional type of approach. So as far as I know, studies are starting to come up. But again, you have to start from somewhere. So when we started with the Women's Grand Project, this was absolutely not in the radar of anybody. And ethnicity is a similar story. People do not want to talk about these differences because you know you can end up in a very political conversation there too. And now we are trying to show that there is scientific value in this type of work. And so more and more literature is accumulating. So I think it's, it's happening. Uh, we will see more papers in the next years. Um, another question I had, <laughs> actually, uh, I guess to play devil's advocate a bit, obviously yeah. it's an exciting time in Alzheimer's research at the yeah. moment with the anti-amyloid therapies, but these are the first generation, right, of drugs. And I, I don't know, I'm interested in your opinion. Is it a case of these are the first generation of uh, amyloid drugs coming through and therefore, of course, they're not perfect and they have other issues as well as the um, sex and gender differences. And therefore, as more drugs get developed, they will be better and, and have an equal or more equal effect, hopefully, uh, in women as well? Or is it, I mean, I'm guessing, you know, cancer therapies at the beginning were also not particularly uh, great or uh, precision medicine based. So do you think that these should have, you know, we should have paid more attention to this in the early stages of uh, these um, Alzheimer's uh, drug discovery or that actually we have again we had to start somewhere and we now have drugs coming through whilst they're not perfect at least it's a starting point and that then gives us a base for like to build on no absolutely i have to 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 tell you this disclaimer is that i work in the lab of professor roger niche that is the inventor of aducanumab so i am a little bit biased on these things in the sense that i'm very excited about these recent developments and i think I don't see this as, as the first generation. These are the second generation of anti-amyloid uh, antibodies because the first generation was solanezumab and that type of stuff, which didn't work at all. But we have built on the mistakes that we were doing in those trials. And now we have a second generation of antibodies that are starting a little bit. Old. And one thing is precision medicine. So when we tested the first antibodies, we were testing it on people that were not biomarker characterized. So we were giving anti-amyloid to people who did not, 30% of them did not have amyloid in their brains. So we have learned 
learned that lesson and now we have the second generation which is by far not perfect but i see this incremental uh, process and i'm very excited of, of this of course what we have now is the result of a research project that's it's been going on for 10 years so 10 years ago nobody was thinking about these sex differences ethnicity and all that so i think now is the moment that we can design new studies for all the new therapeutics that will come which i hope will not be only anti amyloid but also other um, you know pathways especially new related pathways I'm, I'm very excited about that that is a field where there are huge differences between men and women where it would make a lot of sense to test these things already in drug development in animal models or in vitro models already then so my hope is that because we are learning right now we have something that is starting to work but now is the moment to start designing trials in a smarter way that can give us something more precise and more efficacious and also safer uh, in maybe five, uh, ten years. So let's see. But also MS, the people from the, the, in the field of MS, they all tell me, you know, you guys in Alzheimer's, you look like us <laughs> 10, 20 years ago, because also the first treatments that appeared were not super safe, were not perfect for all patients. It was not, but it was a beginning. And now, I mean, having MS now compared to 20 years ago, I mean, now you can live with MS, it's treatable. You don't cure it, but you can live with it. So I think science needs this process. And we are right in the middle of this um, really interesting growth and, and understanding. So I'm very optimistic about this. Two hands have shot up. <laughs> because of the anti-amyloid. <laughs> thank you so much. First, it was very inspiring talk, so thank you so much. And um, so you are talking about the future, you know, how uh, we can improve the new drugs, but I'm also thinking a bit about, about the past. So can we use these studies to revisit maybe drugs that has been developed previously that we are still currently using and not only in neurodegenerative diseases, but in general, to kind of like push the pharma uh, pharmaceuticals to kind of redo the, the the clinical trials, including more women, women than men, for instance? This is a very important question. Thank you for that. It's tricky. Um, we could start by, and we have been proposing this as Women's Brain Project, we could start by reanalyzing data of old clinical trials. We have a lot of data that have not been really checked carefully for these sex differences. Even that is not super easy to do. So we, we have to you know, call to action again to, to uh, all the uh, drug developers for helping us in, in doing this type of job. Um, and in terms of running new trials, of course, that would be ideal for also for existing drugs and testing and seeing the differences. That would be ideal. We have to see if there is a, a political or economic uh, will to do that. And that's why we published the paper with economists because we want to convince people that there is an economic case for doing this type of research. So I think if we can make that point, maybe there will be an interest to, to do this type of uh, studies, confirmatory, repeating, going deeper into existing data uh, and all that. Consider that we are using a lot of drugs right now that have been tested maybe 20 years ago. You know the issue, right? That women were excluded from uh, some stages of, of clinical testing for protecting them, I mean, for the best possible reasons. But the result is that we had we had a gap of knowledge in side effects of drugs in women. And nowadays, women tend to suffer more of side effects. So if you want to be serious about this, there would be a, a whole lot of uh, research to redo completely. So it's a big topic, uh, I think. We have to see what is cost effective in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Very inspiring. Uh, yeah, I actually had a very similar question <laughs> because I know there's a big issue in kind of sourcing the raw data, let's say, of clinical trials. So I was curious if it was easier to kind of reanalyzing previous trials rather than um, having more, but I guess it will have to be a combined effort. And then I have another a different question. Uh, I was wondering about um, women hormon yeah. hormonal contraceptives because of I'm course sorry, hormonal think... contraceptives yes because those also of course reduce your est estrogen level and I was wondering if that's also another active area of research that Alzheimer's or neurological diseases or if someone has looked into that so the first comment, I think, more or less, we, we covered it. But the second super interesting topic, we actually have uh, one scientist in our team collaborating with us uh, who's looking specifically at this in general effects on brain of um, um, uh, anticonceptive, uh, Adelaide uh, Jensen. Uh, the thing is that, I, for instance, this is a topic that I would love to do some research on. The problem is that we don't have data. 
because in all the studies, all the cohorts, in the clinical trials and in all the cohorts and registries that we have right now, this type of information, sex-specific information is not collected, is not captured. So we are currently mapping uh, this type of information in existing databases. In some databases, you have maybe menopause, you know, age at menopause, in the best case scenario, you know, but ideally to really be able to do this type of studies, you would like to know aged men are the use of contraceptives, um, aged menopause, the use of HRTs, uh, parity for men using a use of anti-androgen uh, treatments. I mean, there are a lot of interesting data that we could be collecting. It hasn't been done. So again, um, hopefully we will manage to publish this paper with a bit of a call to action to say that from now on, we should start planning studies that actually capture also this information because otherwise scientists cannot answer these questions. We, we simply don't know. We have no idea. Any more questions? Ah, there's one online. Oh, three more online. Okay. Um, okay, so first of all, are there sex differences in the types rather than the timing of clinical symptoms we see popping up at initial MCI or AD stages and throughout the disease progression? So we, we addressed a little bit this topic in the, in the review, um, and maybe it's time to revise the literature once again to see if there's anything new. Um, what, what was quite striking uh, was actually the fact that the neuropsychiatric symptoms were different between uh, men and women. Uh, and in general, if I remember correctly, men tended to have more apathy, uh, either being apathy or extremely aggressive, and women tended to present more uh, depression and to be more treated with anti-psychiatric um, yeah, anti uh, drugs. Uh, so that was, we made that point in that paper in 2018 that also the type of symptoms might be different and not just uh, the, the, let's say, the extent of the decline. Uh, but I think now it would be time to maybe recheck the literature and see if anything new came up because it's, uh, it's a very interesting topic. And again, it speaks to precision medicine because also not everybody knows, especially in the lay public, that Alzheimer's can present with different symptoms. Um, you, you have, it's not just the memory, you have the atypical presentations, so raising more awareness on this and also identifying if some subgroup of patients present more one symptom than another, I think is very important for precision medicine. I'll take this comment back. Okay, uh, there's also another one that was touched upon uh, earlier, and that is, um, do you think that focusing on sex differences may lead to increased neurosexism if we don't simultaneously quantify the confounding effects coming from gender differences, understood as stereotypes, expectations, etc.? What are your thoughts about preventing or tackling this? Touch upon That's it. what I was mentioning yeah. before. I, mean, I, I think we have to do it. Scientifically, mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do. But we also have to come up with strategies to prevent that. I, I agree. Um, and actually, I'm very open to suggestions here from, uh, from this audience to see how you would uh, address this. I think it's about educating people, so explaining, having a very you know, clear type of communication, um, having a different type of relationship with the press, because a lot of problems come when, when you're interviewed. Um, but I don't know. These are the things that I'm thinking about, education and uh, being trained to talk to, to to journalists, which is difficult for scientists in general. But I don't know if anybody has other ideas of uh, how we could do this. This is definitely a challenge, and I'm very well aware of it. And I'm pretty sure that's why a lot of people do not want to do research in this field. And I understand, um, because it's, uh, I mean, even, you know, you can be attacked and uh, accused of being anti-feminist, which is actually the opposite of what we are trying to do. The idea is to help women, but somehow it can be perceived as completely the other way. And somehow we have to talk to these people. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I don't really have tough one. Uh, genius ideas about it, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe <laughs> if we keep talking, <laughs> yes. Um, this is a tough point because it's also the point I was trying to make. Maybe some sort of structured fact-checking mechanism all these papers. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I, um, maybe a solution could be having a very structured fact-checking mechanism for all these papers that come up and say, mm -hmm. oh, women are not good at visual spatial processing because of this and that. Mm -hmm. And maybe 
uh, kind of uh, direct the press to that fact checking maybe your organization might be a good good start to have a fact checking page so that every time a new study pops up to say women are not good at this or women are not good at that biologically and maybe you can just put a press release and say actually they didn't account for this variable or that variable or yeah women have alzheimer's more because they live longer or you know something like this there's always a social explanation for some of these biological very kind of phenomena that we see in these papers and I think that might help you kind of deflect some of that criticism which I mean I, th I think it's really really important I, mm -hmm. I mean it's so interesting I mean, it generates so much discussion and uh, and to be honest I think uh, you couldn't do this if you were a man because you might attract more criticism so well done I, I think it's a very brave thing to do um, and I have to say there are quite a lot of men who collaborate with us, yeah. so kudos to them because it's not easy. I mean, yes, absolutely. Very great. absolutely. But in the end, the point of precision medicine should be for everybody. You know, that's why we are trying to put it in this context, because when, when you are trying to address the individual characteristics of people, you are, you are, you know, getting a product that is better for a solution that is better for both men and women. So that's how we are trying to propose it. But it is true that in many cases, the issues are more related to women. So we end up talking about... Uh, women specific uh, things so it becomes extremely complicated and risky so yes <laughs> uh, so just to follow up on yeah. that uh, have you looked at maybe doing studies with in different societies or in communities with different uh, social cultural um, backgrounds or situation that so that you would see i mean women would be brought up in a different environment so you'd be able to see what um a specific parameters has variation it wouldn't account for all the environment but it would give you an indication on what traits are environmentally based and what is more biological that's a really really nice uh, concept and um it, i mentioned this when we talk about more women having dementia than men what i personally find striking is that this data this is frequency a number of patients this is true everywhere we have numbers we have measured this statistically everywhere in the world is more women than men so this tells me that there must be something biological about this however when we check incidence for instance this is risk the data are very different in the states in europe south america again where we collect data because there are a lot of places where we don't have statistics so there are several problems one is that we are we have a knowledge gap huge knowledge gap of dementia in different societies and, uh, and second, there are things, when we have looked at different societies, there are things that are different, um, that, that the sex differences do not apply in every single society. So then at that point, it makes you think that maybe you are looking at something that is driven by the society and gender and not so much uh, biology. Uh, but this has not been the topic of any dedicated type of research, you know, and uh, this is actually something we could think about of... Uh, exploiting and, and leveraging uh, the existing data to make some of these points. It's a nice um, way to, to tackle it. Yeah. There was another question online about looking at comorbid comorbidities mm -hmm. with AD and uh, the sex and gender differences there. Do you know if there's any um, any research being done in that area? Yeah, more than um, comorbidities, um, I'm, I'm sure there is research, but right now I, um, I'm more focused on, I've been more, uh, I've been following more the literature on uh, risk factors. So these are also comorbidities, of course, uh, but there is a huge uh, field in the cardiovascular um, area. So cardiovascular disorders tend to be, um, and, and here I'm including also diabetes, um, tend to, to occur together with uh, Alzheimer's and there are risk factors for Alzheimer's. Uh, a lot of them, especially high blood pressure, uh, tend to occur more in men than women, especially before menopause. But we know that actually they pose a greater risk for women than men later on in life. So the cardiovascular aspect is, is also an interesting example of gender medicine, where just looking at the numbers is not enough. You also have to see what happens uh, later on. So also these, these risk factors and these comorbidities can have different profiles, but then one really has to see what is the meaning, the clinical meaning of this uh, difference. Okay, I uh, think if there are no more questions, then I'm um, just say thank you again oh, for coming. It's a super nice interesting discussion. topic and, and for the discussion yeah. afterwards. So, um, yeah, and please continue the discussion. I think downstairs there's some refreshments. So, um, but thank you again for coming. Thank you. And thank, thank you. Thank you.